I forgot to ask you about that. Okay. Um, well, I'd just like to welcome everybody back uh, this week to our next um, installment of the uh, climate series of seminars that we've been organizing together, ICTP and the University of uh, Trento. And uh, this week, we're actually returning now to the impacts theme. We've had uh, in the series of talks so far, one or two talks that have touched on climate impacts or machine learning for climate impacts, which is the talk we had last week. So this follows on very nicely as a topic. So I am very pleased to give a warm welcome to the series to Veronica Huber. Uh, she's a climate impact scientist and she's had a special interest for a long time in human health and aquatic systems. And she's employed uh, various modeling techniques to analyze uh, empirical data for climate impacts. Currently, she's a senior researcher a UPO in uh, uh, Sevilla in Spain, and she was a sectorial coordinator. Uh, she's a sectorial coordinator, I should use the right tense, for health in the uh, Intersectorial Impact Model Intercomparison Project, another of these MIPS that we see in, in climate, and this is for sectorial impacts, and this is actually where Veronica and I got to know each other when in the, the first round of the, so the projects called us the acronym EasyMIP. Uh, we were actually uh, working together on some of the aspects of health where we were contributing various different uh, aspects to that uh, health impacts of the modeling. And I'm, I'm super pleased to hear that she's just had a proposal accepted. So she's now going to become a Marie Curie fellow, uh, moving to LMU in Germany and continue on a good work on climate impacts. So uh, with no further ado, I'd just like to thank you for taking the time to give this talk to us. And I will hand over to you and I will mute myself and, and clear the way. <laughs> and thank you. Yeah, very thank you very much, Adrian. Um, yeah, I'm most happy to speak in this series and thanks a lot for inviting me. It's great to see that you have so many great female scientists um, who presented in this series. So even more happy to, to, to be in this queue of, of female scientists. So I will share my screen. Okay, so can you see this? Yes. Okay, so great. Um, yeah, so um, um, welcome to everyone. Um, and as Adrian said, so this talk will be um, on the health impacts of climate change and specifically on heat and cold related excess mortality. And yeah, just um, the outline of the talk, um, I will first talk a bit of my personal motivation and why I'm, am I studying this and give you some introduction. And then I will present um, some models and the type how we measure actually cold and heat related mortality with an example from Germany I will present something on future projections, also some work in progress on accounting for adaptation in future projections, and then um, at the very end, a global perspective on, on limits um, to heat adaptation. Okay, so let's start. How did I get into this research field? Because I actually did my PhD in, in, in limnology, so working on, on climate impacts on freshwater systems. But now, since a couple of years, I'm, I'm working on, on, on temperature-related mortality and, and health impacts. And so um, how I got motivated is actually by being exposed to climate skeptics arguments. This is really some years ago where um, yeah, I, I helped um, battle some of these arguments. And so this one argument that we came across a lot was that, OK, with climate change, you would expect increases in heat related mortality but it's at the same time with uh, global warming you would also expect um, decreases in cold related mortality and actually the net effect would be an overall decrease in mortality rates and so this is just one book that um, also includes this claim and so at the time i was just okay quite a little bit interested and but i didn't work on this and then my first kind of entry point in all of this was um, working on economic assessment models. And I think you also had a, a talk in this series by Tamar Carlton, who's really an expert on all of this. But this was just a study looking at um, one of these um, economic assessment models. 
and um, yeah, and where the assumption was and also the results were that really um, with climate warming, you would expect uh, a significant decrease in overall mortality related with temperature. And so in this study with, I won't go into details, but we just um, yeah, identified a couple of flaws and by correcting for these flaws, you would actually, we actually got the, the opposite results so that climate warming you would expect that you would, would get an overall increase in, in, in temperature-related mortality. Okay, so this is really my entry point, but now let's really look into um, mortality data. <laughs> and so here um, is a plot of daily death counts in Sevilla, where I'm based. And um, Overlain is just um, um, a spline function, and you can see that there is the seasonal cycle. And what you can also see if you look at when are the peaks, so the peaks are in the winter months. And so this is the, generally the case that you have uh, about 10 to 30% more mortality winter than in the rest of the months. And okay, so this hints a bit at temperature, but of course there's also other seasonal factors that it might underline, underlie this. Then of course there is um, yeah, this public awareness of um, heat waves and their effect on mortality. Um, yeah, most striking in Europe, the 2003 summer heat wave. And here's a photo of um, yeah, Paris. And this is including um, an information to the citizens that um, yeah, it says like, if, if you're looking, um, if you're looking for a victim of the, of the heat wave, then you can, there's a hotline that you can call because actually there were so many people dying in this, um, at, during, these, during this heat wave that they had to set up refrigerated tents outside Paris, of, of Paris because the morgues were overcrowded. out. So we, we do have these stark impacts of heat waves that we are aware of. And here actually, this is also um, a nice comparison because it shows the mortality impact of the 2003 heat wave and it compares it to the first wave of COVID-19 um, last year. And here, what you can see in this figure is um, in light gray, it's just the daily death counts um, in the years 2000 to 2019, and then um, emphasized uh, the death in 2003, and then the, the COVID. And you can see this extremely strong peak in during the heat wave in 2003 and with actually um, on its yes, on most acute actually even than the, the COVID wave, of course, the, the integral of the COVID wave is much bigger. So more people died to, in this COVID, um, first COVID um, wave, but really the, the daily death um, in France during this heat wave, during these um, hottest days in August 2003, they were extremely high. Extremely, um, strong active death. Okay, then something else, uh, something else to, to keep in mind um, when we talk about these um, heat-related excess mortality. So these are actually, um, most of these deaths are actually due to cardiovascular or respiratory causes. So very little are really heat strokes, no? And also important is um, to know is that, yeah, respiratory, cardiovascular causes are, are important, but there are very, very many causes that show um, a relationship, like say, that show that there are excess deaths due to heat. This is actually why in the, in the following, in the studies that I will show you, um, we normally work with all cause mortality. So it's just um, using the, the death registry of the statistical offices without looking further into, into um, cost-specific mortality. Okay, so this, is, um, this was um, an introduction. Let's now look at into the, into the methods of how do we actually yeah, measure cold and heat-related mortality. And so this example comes from a paper I published um, last year um, with data from Germany. Uh, where we had 23 um, years of data and we, 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 we did have all cause mortality time series daily, all cause mortality time series. And we also had um, climate data from, from local weather stations from these cities. And okay, so now uh, 
let's look into the methodology of all of this. So um, the typical way of, of analyzing this data is you use quasi-Poisson time series uh, regression models. Yeah, as the outcome, you would have a logarithm of the daily death counts. And then you have a function that describes your association with temperature. You, and then of course, you also try to, to control for confounders. So what is typically done is that you have um, you introduce some, some baseline trends to control for long-term and seasonal trends, but you can also include some, some confounders varying on a daily basis, which could be like holidays or day of the week, but which could also be other data, data such as um, influenza or other possible confounders that you have data on. Okay, and so um, applying these type of models, the relationships you usually find um, look like that. These are just now two examples um, from my German cities that I worked on. And so um, looking at Berlin, for example, what you normally find that there's a temperature of minimum mortality, no? which, which would be around 19 degrees in Berlin. And below and above this, this temperature, you find that the relative risk of mortality, so this RR relative risk increases. What is also shown on this figure is below, it's a histogram of the daily, temp uh, daily temperature data. So you get an idea of the distribution of the temperature that occur in these cities. And actually the type of models that I've been using and that are usually used in the field now, what they do is they also account for a complex leg structure. What, so what I'm showing here is actually a, a cumulative risk across um, time lengths. And behind all of this is, is this type of leg structure. So you have um, flexible splines that allow you to also look at nonlinear effects here. And so you have this three-dimensional relationship of the relative risk and in, in, in the part as a function of temperature and also at the leg. And if you, for example, look at this three-dimensional figure and you take a slice at a certain temperature. So you, for example, in the first case, you would take a slice at temperature minus five degrees and you would get the results shown um, here. Um, so which shows that actually the, the cold effect on, on, on so the effect of a, of a day at my mean daily temp of mean daily temperature of minus five degree so it would only occur a few days after the exposure, but it would also be um, long lasting and, and lasting around two to three weeks. And on the other side, um, for, for heat, so taking again um, a, a slice through this three-dimensional um, function um, at a temperature, mean daily temperature of 25 degree, um, you would find um, what I show on the right side so the relative risk is actually high on the same day on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the day the exposure happens, but it then uh, falls pretty quickly. So heat, the heat effect is much more acute. And what is also shown that is interesting is that at some point after exposure, the risk falls um, below one. So this is something that is referred to as short-term harvesting. And this is the idea that if, um, some people may die um, from heat, but they would have anyways died a few days after that. So it's kind of, you know, heat is, is um, delimiting the pool of susceptible individuals that would die anyways in a few days. So this, all of, all of this um, is taken into account in this type of models that we use. Okay, so the type of models used normally also what, what is done that there's also a second stage where you do a meta regression because in all of these multi city studies, what you do is you use the information from all of the cities to improve your estimates. So for example, for cities where you would have um, less samples or less, or less certain estimates, you, you, you can improve this by, by, my, by doing meta regressions of the, of the model parameters. Okay, so once um, you have um, your exposure response functions um, estimated and set up, then the next step is really attributing mortality to, to non-optimal temperatures, to cold and heat. 
And so um, what you're interested is, is in the attributable fraction. So you look at um, the percentage of um, yeah, death uh, attributable to temperature out of total death. No? And to do this, um, what you normally, you define your, your heat as all of the temperatures above this minimum mortality temperature, and you call this um, all of the temperatures below the minimum mortality. And then just the sum of these cold and heat attributed mortality is the total um, temperature related mortality. And for example, for my German data, what you find, and this is very typical for, 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 these, <coughs> for, for, for many locations around the world, I will show you this a bit later, um, is that um, there's around, yeah, you, for example, you see all of my cities and on the left side, there's the city average. So in our case, um, we found like a, a little bit of above 6% of total mortality attributable to non-optimal temperatures. And then there would be like around five attributable to cold and around 1% attributable to heat. And to make this a bit more accessible, um, of course, you can translate this also in mortality rates. And so, for example, for heat, this would um, translate into eight heat related annual excess deaths per 100,000 population, which um, for Germany would be like something like twice um, the mortality rate due to traffic accidents. And important here is um, to say that this is of course average, no? Do you would see much higher numbers if you looked at certain heat wave events, of course, no? So this is really averaged across all of these 23 years. And so how does this compare to studies that um, have a more global perspective? And so here's um, an example from, from a multi-city, multi-country study that looks at um, a hundred, hundreds of, of locations around the world. And again, so here you see the heat and the cold related um, mortality, but this time it's also split up into extreme and moderate cold and extreme and moderate heat. No? And what you find in general that the, the cold fraction is much higher than the heat fraction. But of course, if you look at the extremes, um, the extreme cold and extreme heat is much more comparable the burden. And maybe one more thing to point out in this figure is that this is really across different climate types. No? So my, most studies are done for temperate regions. But um, if you look here, there's also tropical countries and subtropical climates. And even in these countries, you find this very general pattern of um, cold and heat related um, mortality. Okay, so let's turn now um, to the climate impacts, <laughs> to future projections. Um, Okay, so um, again, this is from, from the study we did um, for Germany. Um, and so just that you understand the, the, the results that I show um, now is in this case, we were interested at looking at um, mortality estimates at different levels of global warming. So um, we took a typical approach. So where you have um, your scenario data from your climate models. Um, and then based on the global mean temperature data for these models and scenarios, you identify time windows that correspond to certain levels of global warming. No? So here we looked at one to five degrees of global warming. And so once you have identified these time windows, you can then get the local temperature time series to put into your model for the different scenarios and for the different climate models. And in this case, it's also important to point out that when we do these um, studies at the local scale, and there's an additional step of doing um, calibration of your global climate model, your DCM data, um, to make sure that you, you, yeah, you, you calibrate the data with local with weather station data to account for the bias, the model bias, or to remove the model bias to the extent possible. Okay, so these are the results um, here. So um, again, I show on the left side, it's um, the city average for all the cities. And then there's also examples for, for individual cities. And you can see here now on the x-axis, the different levels of global warming. Um, and then on the y-axis, it's the excess mortality. It's this attributable fraction. 
and um, the squares um, are the observed. So what I showed you before. Um, and the dots are now the, the project. And you find pretty much what you would expect. So you would you find an increase, a projected increase of heat related mortality as global warming um, intensifies um, and a decrease in cold related um, mortality. Um, and the total, um, yeah, there's a, a slight increase, especially for the very, very high levels of global warming. And maybe one interesting point to, to, to mention here is only that for some of the cities, for example, for, for Leipzig on the, on the um, upper right, you see that um, actually heat-related mortality exceeds um, cold-related mortality above three degrees of global warming. So this, this, this suggests like a, um, a reversal of this pattern that is seen um, under current day conditions. Okay, but let's now turn to, to my motivation. So what did this um, data on Germany uh, tell me and tell us about this, this question of this climate skeptics um, claim? So does global warming actually um, lead to a net increase or decrease of temperature related mortality? And so here you see again the different levels of global warming, but this time it's just the difference against a condition of one degree global warming, so against present day pretty much. And so you see on a city average that um, our, our projections suggest that net increase actually above at three degrees, above two degrees global warming um, with a very few um, exceptions. So for example, Hamburg down there in the, in the bottom right, um, you don't find this clear um, net increase in, in mortality. Um, but of course, this is just one sample for 12 German cities, and there's um, more studies that looked at this at a, at a more global scale. Here is another example from the same project that um, unites many, many mortality data sets and, and climate data sets. And um, so here now for 23 countries um, doing the same type of projection, actually to point out, um, Germany is missing still in this map, but, but now it's there. We contributed our data also to this um, collaborative effort. Um, yeah, so this is the result um, from this paper. And I hope you can see it. It's, it's pretty small, but um, importantly, so it's the same, kind of the same figure that I showed you before for, for Germany, where you see the, the change in heat-related excess mortality, the change in cold-related excess mortality, and then the the black squares is the net change. And this time it's it's this time here it's done for different RCPs, so for different climate change scenarios, and it's done for different decades in the future. And also this is change against the current decade. And you can see pretty quickly that in most of the regions you would find the same net increase in, in, in mortality, especially for the high emission scenarios. And then there's also some some exceptions where you where whether modeling suggests a decrease in net um, temperature related mortality. So for example, for Northern Europe, East Asia, or Australia, um, this, this modeling suggests a decrease. But I think what is most important here is to, to point out that um, the strongest net increases projected um, occur here in the, in the less developed and the most populated countries, no? for example, or regions. Um, for example, Southeast Asia or, or South America. So it's really the strongest impact is projected for, for regions with, with least adaptive capacities. Okay, so this is um, now this climate skeptics claim revisited <laughs> and, 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 and showing that really this climate skeptics term, at least in these very general terms, cannot, is, cannot be held. But of course, one big caveat in all of what I've shown you before now is that um, these studies they don't account in, they don't account for adaptation, um, and they also don't account for for shifts in in age distributions. They don't um, account for demographic shifts. And so now um, I, I would like to present you a bit of um, work in progress and where we try to account for adaptation in these projections. 
And um, yeah, there's of course very different ways to go about this, but one is that one approach that we have taken in, in the study that I, we are working on right now is that um, what you generally find is that this, this minimum mortality temperature, so this, this optimum temperature, no? so the temperature when the, the, the temperature related mortality risk is lowest, it really um, depends on your local climate. So um, here is an example from Spain with many, many um, Spanish cities and they are ordered here um, in terms of annual mean temperature. And you can see that um, in general, the higher the annual mean temperature, the higher is this um, minimum mortality. So there seems to be some acclimatization to heat. And yeah, then the same, for example, has also been done at a more global scale. This is really from many, many, it's like a kind of a meta-analysis study, including many studies from around the world for different climatic zones. And here relating the minimum mortality temperature again, against um, relating it with um, indicators of local climate. So most frequent temperature at a certain percent, and again, the annual mean temperature. And you find again that there is um, yeah, the, the optimal temperature, so the minimum mortality temperature tends to be higher, the higher the warming. So a strong indication again about acclimatization. And then there's also fewer studies, um, but also some evidence of, of shifting of this optimal temperature in time. So here's an example on the left side from Sweden with a very long um, data series where they find that the minimum mortality temperature has increased quite substantially, quite substantially um, during um, um, the last hundred years. And another study um, from Japan, where they actually also find that the minimum mortality temperature has increased um, over the recent decades. Okay, so then um, our study, how, and so we, the plan was really to use this type of evidence um, from, 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 from the past to, to include this type of acclimatization in future projections. And so now this time we worked with um, daily mortality data from Spanish cities. And so we had 40 years of data. Um, and what we did this time um, is that we, uh, fitted our um, temperature mortality association in different time periods. So we divided our, um, uh, our data in, in eight five-year periods. And we then, um, with some um, sophisticated meta uh, methods, um, we obtained um, these uh, exposure response functions for these different periods. And we also, um, yeah, got these estimates of the minimum mortality temperature for these different periods. No? And so we had these 88 um, data points on the minimum mortality temperature and we regressed that against different climate variables. And so the climate variable most explanatory that turned out was the mean summer temperature. And so we then established a relationship between um, this minimum mortality temperature and the mean summer temperature. And here, what we wanted to do is to decompose this into the temporal and the spatial components. No? So, um, yeah, I think I won't go into too much detail, but we, we, we looked at the intra-city variability, so really in the, the variability in time of this mean summer temperature, and then also in the cross, um, in the spatial variability, no? in the cross-sectional variability. And so then we fit up these mixed effects met regression model on this and with the plan to then use this coefficient to be able to project the mean minimum mortality temperature um, based on, on future projections of the mean summer temperature. No? And so this is done um, here now. So for the example of two cities, um, Barcelona and Madrid, um, you see in, in black the observed data. So you have, um, these are actually five, these five year periods. No? So this is like each, each um, point is like, a, yeah, it's, it's always these five year periods. And so you, you see the mean summer temperature and the uh, minimum mortality temperature in black. And you see really how the minimum mortality temperature tracks the um, mean summer temperature. And then based on the 
relationship I showed you before, we then use the projections from five GCMs of mean summer temperature to project these minimum mortality temperatures out into the future for two different scenarios. And then we use these to um, define acclimatization scenarios. So we have a default where we just um, do what we did in my first German study. So we, we, we just use the fixed uh, minimum mortality temperature. You don't shift anything, which is the solid lines in these figures. And then we have another scenario, which is the acclimatization scenario with shifting these minimum mortality temperatures according um, to these projections. And so now this is a bit complicated, but let's look at the highest emission scenarios so at the red lines, no? And you, you find um, in first, if you look at the solid lines, you find pretty much um, the same as we found for, for our German studies. This is actually the city average here. So you have a strong increase in heat and a, and a decrease in cold. And in the total, you have like at the end of the century, you would also find a, a, a net increase in the, in the mortality. But then if you, if you, if you um, assume this, this acclimatization, if you just um, project these minimum mortality temperatures um, out into the future, then um, you see that really, um, yeah, there's a very strong effect. And the, this so suggests that the time and pace of acclimatization that we see in our data in our past four, year, four decades if you assume that the same pace is maintained into the future, then really the expected increases and changes are, are much, much, much lower. No? And so the, the question really is, okay, what is behind these shifts in the minimum mortality temperature that we see in our data set? What type of, 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 of yeah, mechanisms are behind that? And I think this is really, um, yeah, something for future research, but um, just to mention a few things. And um, of course there is um, air conditioning and there is, um, there is um, unfortunately not a lot of very good air conditioning data, so residential air conditioning data out there, but um, some studies have, have, have now included this. And um, so one of these studies, and they have never related just to the minimum mortality temperature. So this is something to be done, but this is, um, they have, um, try to incorporate in a different way. Um, and this is just an example from um, a recent study where they had air conditioning data for four countries and um, where here you can see, again see attributable fractions and they compared so the, the beginning of the time series with the end of the time series. So in dark blue, it's, it's the beginning of the time series and in, in light blue, it's the end. And you see that there is a strong reduction in attributable fraction um, due to heat. No? So this is really focusing on around heat. And then you can do a counterfactual um, analysis, where, analysis where you just assume that um, the air conditioning would, have, would not have increased. And so you see that this is like this middle blue. You see that um, um, you would still find a strong decrease in the heat attributable fraction. But of course, not as much as the without accounting for this effect. So the, the air conditioning has played has played a minor role, according to the study, in, in, in changes in the vulnerability to wet heat. And then there's this other factor, of course, also studied, um, is uh, the question of green areas in urban spaces. And yeah, there's a lot of evidence on. Um, the yeah uh, the buffering of, of green spaces um, in terms of vulnerability to wet heat. So this is just an example from Berlin that showed that in districts where there is le less densely built up structure, the effect of heat waves on on mortality is, is less than in, in these more densely um, structured urban areas. So this is really definitely also something to take into account if you want to. Um, build much more um, concrete and explicit adaptation scenarios. And then um, another question is, of course, these heat health prevention plans, so early warning systems, all of this policies that were set up, um, especially, um, for example, here, another study from, from Spain, from, which looked at the effectiveness of heat health prevention plans. And here, they split their data into um, uh, the period before the 2000 heat wave 
2003 heat wave and after the 2003 heat wave, because this is really after the 2003 heat wave, a lot of countries um, implemented more of these heat health prevention plans. And so here in this study, they'd really try to evaluate whether these um, heat health prevention plans had any, any effect. And so, um, yeah, this figure shows you um, on the X axis, um, yeah, kind of the comprehensiveness of these heat health prevention plans. It's, it's yeah, um, the more on the right, the better is the plan. <laughs> and um, on the Y axis is just the difference between the, the second period and the first period in the attributable fraction. So on, on, the, at, on, on, the heat, on the heat burden. And so um, this suggests that, yeah, they, these heat health prevention plans, they did have effect and they reduced these um, heat um, attributable fractions, at least um, if they were well set up. And so this is another thing, of course, to look into in more detail if you want to really understand this acclimatization phenomenon better and we, better, and we also want to include this in a better way in, in, in adaptation projections in the future. Okay, so um, then, yeah, let's, I thought then when I structured my talk, let's also take a bit the bird's view and um, zoom out a bit. And so, um, of course, there's a lot of work on this topic. Um, yeah, heat and climate change is, of course, um, a very important topic. And so there's also many, many studies that look at this, into this um, not working with mortality data. So it's not it's more climatolo climatology than, than, than epidemiology. But I thought I, will, I would also present through three um, studies um, to end with on, from, this, from this field of research. And so there's one study um, that I took a really nice approach also to that they did a lot, um, a, a huge search on reported um, lethal heat events. And they identified the climatic conditions during these events and they paired that with also climatic conditions in the same locations who then use machine learning techniques to identify conditions where, 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 where heat kills. And so this is what you can see on the left side. They found um, that really um, the main predictors are average daily temperature and average daily relative humidity. And um, all of these black downs, dots correspond or crosses uh, correspond to these lethal events. And then um, these uh, blue and red line, they really, they, they define your, your deadly conditions. And, so, and, and then using, um, in this case, these red line of saying, okay, um, beyond that, um, these are deadly climatic conditions. They looked into um, the occurrence of these conditions on the present day, here above, historical, and then also for, for future projections. And here, so in this, on the right side is now shown the number of days per year where these threshold, this, this, this threshold is crossed above the deadly threshold. And you can see that in the historical data, there's um, some uh, locations in the world where, yes, they are crossed for, for a number of days. But then if you look um, at the end of the century for this very high emission scenario, that you find, yeah, this extends extremely um, in these lower latitudes. And you have actually um, even locations where you would have um, these deadly conditions year round. So this is, I think, a really interesting study. Of course, it's caveats, but it's a really interesting study to, to look at how, yeah, how, yeah, this challenge of, of, of heat, especially in the lower latitudes. And another um, study coming pretty much to similar conclusions um, is this one, um, where the where the where the authors um, looked at something what they call the human climate niche. So they used. Um, big data sets on um, the distribution of the population across the globe. And they also um, looked at um, what are the mean, mean annual temperatures that, that these populations are exposed to. So you, on the left side there, you see this, this plot of the population density of the globe in different time periods. So current is this uh, light blue, but for example, you would also have um, this green, which would be um, 500 before present. So they have these paleoclimatic data sets as well and, and estimates of, 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 of historic and, and, and prehistoric uh, population um, distributions. And, and you pretty much find that, you know, um, in all of these 6,000 years, the population distribution 
uh, was pretty similar. So you have these two peaks, one around 13 degrees mean energy temperature, and then around 25, which is pretty much the Indian monsoon region. And then, of course, you can also plot into this the future projections. And here again, for, for high emission scenario, RCP 8.5, and this would be your red uh, line on the left side. And you see how really this the climate change, the unmitigated climate change will, will move um, a lot of the population out of the niche that they have experienced for 6,000 years. And then and there's another way of showing this is if you, for example, look at this um, rest of you to look at this limit of, of the mean inner temperature of 29 degree, and you look at the globe and you see where is this mean inner temperature um, exceeded in the world. And so today it's, it's, it's these black, black blobs. So it's only in the Sahel regions that you, you have a mean annual temperature of above 29 degrees. But then with this high emission scenario, this, this area would extend to many, many regions in the low latitudes. And so um, with population projections, because these are also the regions where population is growing fastest, you would have um, a great, I think, I think it's 30% of the of the projected population is exposed to these extremely high mean annual temperatures, something that humans haven't experienced in the last 6,000 years. And or where, they, where they haven't lived in the last 6,000 years. So this is another studying pointing to these um, heat challenges. And maybe last but not least, I think my time also is coming to the end um, because I think this links also nicely with climatology. There's other very interesting studies that really try to define absolute limits of human adaptability, looking at thermodynamic uh, limits in terms of how can a, a human body cool itself. And so based on this, you can define a wet bulb temperature, which is like, um, uh, it's defined by this um, the temperature if you cover a normal thermometer bulb with a wet cloth and you ventilate it properly, then this is the temperature. So it's really combining humidity and temperature. And yeah, and so on this, based on the thermodynamics thinking, you, you can define this lethal limit, which is an absolute lethal limit. And um, so then you also can look at, has this ever been reached in the past? And you find uh, not. And then you can look at, in this case, extremely high worst case scenarios. And you would find that many parts of the globe would actually experience this in peaks. And of course, this would be, yeah, in a way, non-adaptable because if you stepped outside or your air conditioning failed, this would be lethal. So I think, and there's a lot of and now also studies looking at this and looking at this in more detail, and also even finding that for very high emission scenarios for um, um, but until the end of the century, you would even cross this limit in some individual locations um, of the world. So yeah, just I think this summing up this enormous challenge uh, that climate change is, uh, and in this time in terms of, of heat exposure. Okay, to, to sum up very, very quickly. So um, yeah, um, I think I showed you that how cold and heat exposure is related with excess mortality. I showed you um, that um, if in under um, assumption of no adaptation, um, most studies um, suggest that you, we should um, expect a net increase in temperature attributable mortality, which is contrary to other widespread claims of climate skeptics. Then um, I also um, showed you the study on, on accounting for acclimatization and um, that I think these type of adaptive measures that we know of, they need to be studied further and they need to be included in mortality projections. And then at the, at the very end, um, yeah, if mitigation efforts fail, um, large uh, region of lower lat latitudes uh, will be exposed to extreme heat conditions and they will probably exceed the adaptive capacities. And this is something I haven't said yet, but of course, these studies often conclude that this, this, the only way out is massive migration. And I think it's just also an important factor to keep in mind when we think much more broadly from a, from a bird's view um, about climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica. That was really interesting. And uh, as I suspected, there, there have been some questions coming in on the chat while you've been speaking. So we'll go straight to the questions and I will invite in order 
to unmute. Uh, so hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so my question was, uh, as you, you focused, the, the first part of the project focused on the mortality in cities where obviously there are more people and more data available. And you talked a bit about uh, the, the difference between